Well, as some of as some of you will know, my charts are usually uh, express a reasonably strong point of view, and I was uh, asked. I guess I was really told today to not be opinionated, to be fair and balanced. So you're going to get a lot of on the one hand and on the other hand, which is not my core strength. And it reminds me, it reminds me of a line that Harry Truman was once uh, once uh, said, which was that what he really wanted in life was a one-armed economist. So. Um, <laughs> I'm not even an economist, so you're going to get less than that. But I'm going to try very quickly to put some uh, flesh, uh, some specifics around what David just alluded to, and I'm going to talk really fast because I've got about 20 some odd slides and nine minutes and 21 seconds left to talk about them. Um, so I'm going to try to cover four subjects really quickly: jobs, wages, income inequality, and what we call corporate short-termism. Not everything that David just spoke about, but at least a few of them. So let's start with jobs. Uh, as everybody knows, I think the overall employment picture has been quite strong. We've had 70-some-odd straight months of job increases, averaging about 200,000 jobs a month for the past year. And as part of that, our unemployment rate, which got up to 10 percent at the peak of the recession, is now at 4.7 percent, which is most economists would consider to be at or very, very close to so-called full employment. So that's all good news. What's less good news is that participation in the labor force, and that is people over 16 years old choosing to say, I'm looking for work, or they have a job, has been declining really since the recession, uh, since really since 2007 or 2008. It peaked back in 1970, uh, I'm sorry, it, was, it is lo as low as, it, oh, sorry, it is lower than it has been since 1977. And there are really three reasons that most people ascribe to it. One is demographics, that we are an aging society, and that's about half of the total effect. Another is the effect of the recession, which drives people out of the labor force. And as you can see, the pink bars have been getting larger and the green bars have been getting, uh, sections been getting smaller as the two change. And then there's a hunk that the at economists basically say, we don't really know what's going on here, but it's obviously not particularly good news. And what's also not good news is when you compare this to other countries. So this goes back to 1990, and it compares uh, all the OECD countries, about 24 countries, I think, to each other. And you can see that we are the third ones from the left. If you can read that out there, I can sort of see it here. Third ones from the left, and we're kind of right in the middle of the pack. And this is simply what they call prime age males, males 25 to 54 who are at the peak of their uh, careers. And you can see at that point we were in the low 90% range, right in, as I said, amongst our competitors. But here's what's happened since then. Uh, while participation has dropped in some other countries, it's actually dropped more in the US. And we are now the third lowest of all of these countries in this percent of prime age male. So we're lower than all the European countries. We're lower than pretty much everybody. And the picture isn't really any better if you look at women. We actually have today about the same uh, labor force participation among prime age women as Japan, and we don't think of Japan as exactly a bastion of female empowerment. So there's something obviously going on. So if you look at who's dropping out, it really is mostly the less educated. And again, we're focused here on prime age males. And so you can see that since 1964, their participation, which was pushing 98%, has really dropped only slightly to about 94%. If you look at people who have some amount of college, it's dropped by more, it's down to 88%. And if you look at people who have high school or less, it's down to 83%. So what that obviously means is that 17% of males between 25 to 54 with a high school education or less are not even looking for a job. They're not in the labor force today. And uh, David mentioned some of the social issues, which I'm really not going to get into here, but you can easily imagine the impact on drug use and, and family structure and a whole bunch of other things. Let's talk for a second about the gig economy, which has gotten a lot, of, uh, a lot of attention. It has obviously grown very fast. This simply addresses people who have gotten uh, jobs through or working as part of online services like Uber or Airbnb or TaskRabbit or eBay. And you can see that a few years ago it was effectively nobody. It's now up, but it's only really up to 1% of the labor force, about evenly di uh, divided between uh, firms that are considered to be labor, users of labor, like Uber, where you're driving, and firms that are considered to be users of capital, like Airbnb, where you have an asset that you're putting to work. And what's interesting is that, in con in the, put that in context, you can see that the number of people who are self-employed as a percent of the labor force has actually been dropping during these, this period. 
And so it is a little hard at this moment, uh, as much as the gig economy is in the news, to see that this has, so far anyway, transformed uh, our labor force. Let me turn to wages. David talked about uh, the situation with wages. So first, just as a basic, as everybody probably knows, wages are supposed to track productivity. The more you produce, the more you get. And until about 1973, that essentially was happening. But since 1973, there's been a huge disconnect between productivity and wages. And people's incomes are simply not going up as they have produced more. Now, most recently, there is some evidence that wages have begun to rise. This is median family incomes, and as you can, adjusted for inflation. And as you can see, they really, from 2000 till 2008, they essentially didn't move. Then they plummeted, and they've been gradually rising a little bit. But what's interesting, and just again to give you both sides of the picture, is that in the last year and a half or so, there's actually been a pretty substantial increase in median uh, average wages. And this is something that one would expect to happen as the economy gets stronger, but we've not seen a lot of evidence. Now, to be fair, their wage data is very confusing. I'm not going to explain these different measures, but there are many measures of wages, some of which show less uh, improvement, some of which show a little bit more improvement, some of which show still more improvement. Uh, and so you can take all this for what you will, but it does appear that at the moment, wages are just starting to rise ever so slowly. Now, at the same time, corporate profits are near a record. Uh, in terms of these, this shows corporate profit margins, but if you looked at it in dollars, you'd see the same thing. So you've basically got corporations doing very well, workers not doing so well, even if they might be doing a little bit better at the moment. And so why is that? I'm not going to get into these different reasons, but this is the checklist I'm sure the next two panels will, globalization, technology, tax policy, declining unionization, and what we call winner-take-all labor markets. Um, no presentation like this would be complete without saying a word about income inequality. Um, this looks at something called the Gini coefficient, in which zero is perfect equality and one is perfect inequality. And so again, if you go back to 1985, you can see that among this group of countries, we did have the highest Gini coefficient, we did have the highest level of income inequality. But what's happened since then is that our level of income inequality has risen faster than pretty much all of them. And so we now very much stand out in the pack. Um, another way to think about this or this problem is what does a, a country do to help those who are uh, behind? And so if you look at income before government gets involved, before taxes, before social programs, we're actually in the mix somewhere. And you can see that we're not even the most unequal country in terms of pre-government transfer, pre-social program um, uh, income inequality. But if you then look at what we do, we actually do less as a government to redistribute, I know that's a sometimes ugly word, but to redistribute income to those less fortunate, and that puts us very much at the top of the pack. And then my last uh, subject is the, is the question of, are companies short, too short-term? Are they managing too much for quarterly earnings? Are they, are they not investing uh, for the future? And I think here the, uh, there's some interesting evidence that I want to show you all. So first, if you look at companies, what they do with their excess cash, since 2009, the amount of money they've spent on, the annual amount of money they've spent on share repurchase has essentially tripled, and this has gotten a fair amount of attention. The amount of money that they devote to dividends has gone up by two-thirds, also gotten a fair amount of attention. The amount of money that's gone to investment has only risen by 41%, which is why you hear a fair amount about, one of the reasons why, anyway, you hear a fair amount about corporate short-termism. But Business spending is actually somewhat better than perception. And again, this goes all the way back to 1970. It looks as bu at business spending as a percent of GDP. And so if you look at equipment, you can see that the line has trended down a bit over that period of time, and there are reasons for it that, again, I'm not going to have time to get into. If you look at uh, structures, and I, we've taken energy out of this because it's very volatile, you can also see it's trended down a little bit over that period of time. If you look at spending on intellectual property, which is things like software, that's not surprisingly gone up a lot. And so when you put them all together, you actually see total business spending outside of energy as a percent of GDP essentially oscillating within a band. Now, I would say quickly that in these last couple of quarters, there's been a, good, a bit more uh, investment weakness, which I think has a variety of explanations. But if you take a somewhat longer view, it's hard to see that business here is just is simply stopped investing. And similarly, if you look at business spending on R&D, it is essentially at a record high, again, as a percent of GDP. Companies are spending more and more on business investment. And then lastly, the question of, does the stock market reward companies that choose to invest rather than create more short-term profits? 
And what this chart shows is that companies that invest the highest percentage of their revenues in research and development actually have had the fastest growth in the stock market. Not entirely surprising because of the tech industry, but what is interesting for those who think that the stock market simply doesn't reward long-term performance is think about companies like Amazon, which essentially has made almost no profit in its history, has a 400 billion, because, because Jeff Bezos is so committed to investing, has a $400 billion market capitalization today, or Google, which is now actually called Alphabet, a uh, similar but less, slightly less dramatic story. It's very hard to, make the, to me to make the argument that the stock market is incapable of rewarding companies that choose to invest. And with that, I am 33 seconds over, and I thank you very much for listening. That was a tour de force. Thank you, Bob and Melissa, for joining us. Um, so all we have to do is explain all that. Um, uh, why, fundamentally, Bob, why is this happening? Well, I, I think we're into an endlessly complex subject, David. Let me make a few points, and then Melissa, who knows a heck of a lot more than I do, will, 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 will chime in. I think what fundamentally has happened, you could see in the beginning, you could see the beginnings of in the 90s. Globalization and technological development have contributed enormously to growth. And of course, since the 90s, technological development has become vastly more important relative to globalization. But at the same time, they put tremendous pressure on jobs, on wages, and they've created a lot of job insecurity, and they certainly have fed inequality. So the great challenge, it seems to me, is to continue to maintain a commitment to technological development and rapid technological development of great impact, and to globalization, though that's a far less important factor, but at the same time, to do what we did do some of in the 90s, and President Clinton used to talk a lot about it. President Clinton used to say, the world is changing, we have to prepare the American people to adapt to change, and he talked about lifelong learning, a lot of other things. Obviously, the pace of that has increased enormously in the years since President Clinton was in office. And what I think, and I'll wind up, I guess, with this, oh, one, one other item, and then I'll, I'll wind up with a, with a comment. I think also the, the, the loss of, uh, the, the deunionization, if you will, has had a real effect, and what we need to do is to reestablish fair terms with respect to the ability of workers to decide whether or not they want to engage in collective bargaining. I, I, I think the, the following, David, I think what we really have are transcendent economic conditions with the enormous developments in technology, and we need a transcendent economic policy that deals with the traditional issues, uh, public investment, structural reform, and obviously our unsound intermediate and longer term fiscal trajectory, but at the same time that it does that, and, and, and in these categories, has innovative and creative approaches to dealing with this enormous pressure that we have on wages and jobs. And I think there's, enorm I think there's a lot that we could do. Some will work, some won't do. But ultimately, and this will be my final comment, the ability of our country, I, I believe the United States has <laughs> comparative advantages and strengths that make us the most interesting place in the world to do business and to invest. And I would rather have play our cards in the global economy than those of any other country. But to realize those opportunities, or to realize that potential, we have to meet hugely consequential policy challenges relating to growth, broad-based participation, the benefits of growth, and economic security. And that means that our political system has to work. And fundamentally, while some significant pieces of legislation have been done, they've all been associated, or virtually all have been associated with special circumstances. And as all of you well know, predominantly, our political system has broken down. Congress has simply been unwilling to govern. And in my opinion, the critical question for the future of our country and our economy is whether or not Congress will reestablish the commitment to governance, the will to compromise, and serious as purpose about policy. Melissa. Um, so I'll, I'll pick. I'll pick up on, you know, I'll, I'll agree with a lot of what Bob said in the sense that what a lot of these trends reflect are underlying secular, somewhat global forces. They're not reflective of any discrete policy failures or mistakes on the part of the U.S. government. Um, but there are long-term trends, technological, 
advances have really favored high-skilled workers. We've heard this story for a long time, and, and I think there's a lot to it. Uh, you know, the advances that we've seen in technology have complemented the skills of those with the highest levels of education, particular skills that are complements, and they've eroded the economic security and opportunities for a lot of mid-level and lower-level skill jobs. Uh, and that's not particular to the United States. We see that in some extent you know, to an even greater degree in, in Europe. And so those forces, uh, you know, threaten the security and they're very real. Um, globalization, trade has piled on. So everything's going in the same direction. And then, you know, there is a role of institutions, as, as Bob has mentioned. The real value of the minimum wage has declined, unionization has uh, diminished in coverage. And so all of these forces are working together um, to harm less educated, lower skilled workers, and many of them benefit you know, folks with the, the highest levels of skills. So that's what I've focused on is all earnings inequality. All of our demographic trends also pile on to make household income inequality even larger. So you've got high earning men marrying high earning women, and they have really high household income. And then at the bottom, you have less educated Americans not getting married, having children out of wedlock, and you have those homes run by low-income single mothers. And so household income has diverged even greater than what just earnings inequality would have done. Let's, let's stay on the government dysfunction for a minute. So there are a bunch of different stories that try to explain that, right? One is that we used to have this kind of mush of parties in which we had liberal Republicans from the Northeast and conservative Democrats from the South. And actually, it didn't make a lot of sense, but it made governing easier because it made building these coalitions across parties easier. Um, and that now we actually have these more rational and less functioning um, parties sorted by ideology. Some people argue that inequality has led to greater political polarization. Um, uh, how do you think about what are the fundamental forces behind this breakdown that you, you said you see as essentially the single greatest threat to American power in the world? You know, David, I lived it a little bit in the 90s. Uh, the 90s were a very difficult time politically, more difficult than the period prior to our, our time there. But <laughs> there still was a willingness on the part of both parties in Congress to get together, and though, albeit with a lot of difficulty. So in 1997, you had the balanced budget agreement. Trent Lott, I was in the Oval Office when the final deal was struck. Trent Lott and President Clinton had very different views, but in the final analysis, each one was willing to give up something they cared about in order to move forward. That treaty could not, that, I'm sorry, that balanced budget agreement could not possibly pass today. What do I think happened? I'm not, I'm not a political analyst, and Jim Baker once said to me, I'm not licensed to practice politics. That's when he and I are arguing about something, and he said he was better informed than I was. He's probably right. But what I think is that this started with bad behavior that goes back decades, and bad behavior begot bad behavior. And then you had gerrymandering, which we all know about, you had people moving into like-minded neighborhoods so that even without gerrymandering, you would have divided uh, uh, districts. And then you had, and what I'm about to say isn't popular in some quarters, but you had the social media. And the social media, although it certainly is a force for great good in many ways, is also an echo chamber for ideology and politics, and I think it's made government far more difficult than if you ask sitting cabinet members in the Obama administration, I think they would predominantly agree with that. And then you had Citizens United which is really a deeply destructive decision, in my opinion. I'm probably missing some things, David, but those are the ones that come to my mind. And then, and then I'll add one more, if I may. With so many of the American people feeling the system is not working for them, they're now displaying the anger, the alienation, which is very understandable. But it also means they're not willing to support government in constructive policy. And very often, they're in favor of more extreme ideology and against compromise. At the same time, you have an economy that desperately needs to meet our challenges. There is the potential for a vicious cycle in that, where they feed each other. And that could be deeply destructive to the, I'm sorry, deeply destructive to the future of our country, which is why I said before, I think the future of our country depends. I mean, we all care about the presidential election, we should do that. But beyond that, there is this question, will Congress reestablish the willingness to govern? And I think it is upon that which the future of our country depends. Is there a silver lining to this presidential campaign? So both parties clearly have their relatively extremist wings. 
and as a journalist, I'm supposed to say it's all the same in both parties. But I actually think it's not the same. I think the extremist wing in the Republican Party is substantially more empowered than the extremist wing in the Democratic Party. You can see that from Bernie losing. You can see that from Obama taking on the teachers' unions. You can see that, I think, in a number of ways. Um, is there a way, which isn't to say the Democrats don't have their problems, they do, but is there a way in which this Republican situation could lead to a reordering of the Republican Party and a Republican Party that is more interested in governing than it has been recently? Look, I'm not an expert in Republican politics, but I just did a, I was out with Peter Hart both uh, Monday and Tuesday in San Francisco and Peter and I discussed this, so I'll can sort of reflect a little bit what I heard. I think the problem, David, is that on the national level, the Republican Party desperately needs to do what you're talking about. But for the individual congressman who runs in his district, which is like-minded to him or her, it, that, that's, a, that's, that's a different calibration. And I think that's been part of the problem, maybe my impression, David. If, if there's anything positive that might come out of this, what we're seeing in this election, what I would say is this should really shake all of us out of any notion that our capitalist system is working for the majority of people, right? And so, you know, a recent poll this week said 71% of respondents thought the economy was rigged. I don't even know what that means for the economy to be rigged, but the fact that this many people believe that is really bad, right? And so we have to change the trajectory of what's happening. We have to really uh, have large transcendent policies to address the fact that 71% of people in this country no longer believe that if they work hard and get education, they can achieve economic success. So if anything, maybe we can take this as a, a wake-up call across the political spectrum and, and respond with collective action. For those of you who are on Twitter, you should make sure you follow Melissa. You had a great tweet about that. It basically just said, I have no idea what this means, but it's really bad. It's really bad. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, I'm just going to say, Melissa and I have worked with each other for years, and she, Melissa is really deeply thoughtful about these trends in our economy and our society. The problem, though, it seems to me, Melissa, is we desperately need to do something about this, but who is the we? The we has to be that, and, and unfortunately what I, David said, is I, don't, I try not to be partisan, but it is true. The Freedom Caucus in the House of Representatives is basically holding the country hostage, at least in my opinion. And unless that changes, I don't see how we manage to legislate. And if we can't legislate, yeah, a president can do things by executive power around the edges, but fundamentally what needs to be done needs to be done legislatively. So there's, a, there's an assumption here to a bunch of our conversation that I want to push you each on, which is that government is the answer. And wh why isn't it the case that government getting out of the way is the answer? Why couldn't we look at these trends and say, look, the reason why we have slow income growth is we have too much government. And the answer is a sort of second Reagan revolution in which we cut taxes and we get rid of regulation and we unleash the, um, the competitive energies of the American people. You want to well, before you clap, before you clap, you better hear the response. <laughs> they were clapping for the you question, not the response. Okay, so, uh, you know, I, again, I, I don't think we can blame this on a failure of government policy, but there are things that government can do to make it better or worse. I do not think it's the case that um, if we lower top tax rates, somehow we're going to see more wealth created at the top and trickle down. Like, we can't believe that anymore. We haven't seen Why it not? Because it hasn't happened. It hasn't happened, right? Um, but I do think there are places where if government got out of the way, maybe we'd see more job creation. So occupational licensing is a great example. But that's not even federal government being in the way. That's state and local governments being in the way, right? Uh, uh, you know, what's it? Thirty percent of our workforce now needs a government permission to perform their job. Right? I mean, it's, it's, just, it's not justified by the consumer and safety benefits. So that's one place, maybe. I think, though, you're right, that the solution doesn't all have to be with government. I'm going to put a lot of emphasis on what institutions of education can do, higher education institutions. So I know some people are tired of hearing that the answer to this inequality story is massive skill upgrading and improved education, but I really think that if there's one thing we can bet on to help workers, it's not betting on a better, a higher minimum wage, it's betting on more Americans having the skills demanded by the modern economy. And so our our institutions of higher learning, they need to be reformed. And I'm not talking about 
everyone should be able to go to college free. What I'm talking about is the fact that you know, fewer than 30% of low-income kids who go to community college graduate with a degree or transfer to a four-year institution. This should be a fabulous institution where people can transition from K through 12 into the workplace, and we need to make that stronger. Um, a lot of the reason why, you know, if you, you know, I, 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 the, the work of Larry Katz and Claudia Golden is really influential and compelling on this. In early parts of the 20th century, there were also technological developments that benefited high-skilled workers at the expense of low-skilled workers. And in their argument, the reason why this didn't lead to such widespread inequality was because we had a massive increase in education. And we haven't responded in the same way. And so that falls to both our institutions of learning, but also individuals, um, you know, to, to obtain those higher levels of school. So I do think we need to put a lot of emphasis there, and that involves state governments, local governments, and, and you know, the system. Yeah, I, I agree with what Melissa said, but let me, let me add this. There are a whole host of really powerfully important measures that we have to take that have to be done by the federal government. We need immigration reform. We need public investment infrastructure, and while states can do some, the resources are at the federal government. We need investment excuse me, in basic research. We need criminal justice reform. That's partly a state issue, but it's part, and that's an economic issue, by the way, not just a social issue, and that, that's a, a federal issue. So there's a great, there's a great deal of uh, poverty. 20% of the American kids will live in poverty. That, aside from being morally outrageous, speaks hard, it speaks, it's a very dangerous, excuse me, fact with respect to the future of our economy. A great deal that has to be done, I think, is going to have to be done with federal resources. In dealing with these questions of technological displacement and the like, we are going to need new kinds of policies. I think we're probably going to need public employment at the federal level, at least on a transitional basis, in order to provide people with social skills, in order to provide employment where it doesn't otherwise exist. There's a great deal else that going to have to be done that my judge now to get government out of the way I think one thing we could do is I think we should have a cost benefit framework for regulation and I think that would be very helpful but I so I think it's a combination but fundamentally I think we have an enormous number of these basic challenges of which I a trade liberalization is another one I know is not very popular at the moment but I do think it contributes to our well-being there's a great deal else that we need to do uh, the, the Danish have some kind of a system where they companies can hire and fire as they see fit but when people are let go and displaced for technological or other reasons, they get training and they get support while they seek new jobs. There are a whole array or a whole host of these kinds of initiatives that we should be looking at. I just want to spend one more minute on education because there, as you alluded to, Melissa, there is this undercurrent of skepticism that yeah. college is overrated and, and student debt is the next housing bubble. And I, I think it's just really important to take that on for a second because um, it, as I read the evidence, it's just wrong. Right, the gap between college graduates and everyone else is at an all-time high. Okay. Uh, um, you mentioned the Cats and Golden book, the race between education and technology. We've seen over history that when people get skills, they tend to make more money, and that we've had this kind of stagnation of educational attainment over time. The way I think about this is you have all these people who are uh, education skeptics running around out there, working for think tanks, writing articles in newspapers. They're only skeptical about education for other people's children. They're all sending their own children to college. And to me, that suggests that the bubble is in education skepticism, not education. Is, is there any part of that that either of you think is, is too sunny? Um, so, so no, I agree with what you said entirely. Uh, you're right that the gap is larger than ever. A college graduate now makes twice as much as a high school graduate, and there's no reason to think these trends are going to change. So in the past 30 years, college graduates, men and women, have seen their wages rise substantially, and for the median workers, they're, they're essentially flat. Um, where I think it's too sunny is, we can't just say, let's get everyone to college, right? We have to actually think about what college is delivering and what skills are that people need, right? And so, and the, the other thing to point out about this is a lot of our experience with college is a four-year liberal arts education, but that is not what college is to the majority of people of college. So a lot of people, uh, you know, are at non-selective schools and they're going to get trained for the labor market. The other thing I think we need to realize is 
we can no longer think about college or higher education as something that someone does for four years in their 20s and then they're set to work for life. We are definitely, the, the, de the labor market and the demands of the labor market change so rapidly that we are going to have to rethink that formulation and people are going to have to have access to you know, ways to upgrade their skills throughout their lifetime. Um, the other thing I do wanna say though about an important role for government in all this is the idea of skill upgrading and more people being equipped to be successful in this economy is very important and is first order. But along with that, I really think we need to rethink our social contract. So increasingly people with high levels of skills command high wages and people with lower levels of skills are relegated to lower paid service sector jobs. We need a commitment to bolstering their wages, whether it's through an expanded earned income tax credit, wage insurance, or lots of other options. But we also need to think about the people who are unable to increase their skills, who are unable to engage in, high, you know, in, in paid employment, or simply unwilling. And even if you wanna think those people who won't work are making poor choices, they have children who are growing up in poverty and are coming up to the plate you know, with two strikes against them, how are they ever going to be in a position to be successful in this economy? So we really do need a stronger set of supports for people who are making low wages or no wages, and in particular for their children. I would make the, I think that's totally right. <laughs> you know, David, I would make the argument that, that actually the, the survival of capitalism is gonna depend on supporting a market-based economy or economics, and also having a strong government to deal with these immense challenges that have now developed with respect to the great well, majority of our people who feel that this system is no longer working for them. Brexit, seems to me, makes a very important point. When people no longer believe the system works for them, then they're going to turn against what we all would consider sound policy. So, Bob, you're known as a market-friendly Democrat. A lot of the things we're talking about up here cost money. Yep. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the scale of the tax increases that you would be comfortable with, or um, if you think we should be getting the money from, from somewhere other than tax increases? Yeah, I'm not sure what the scale is, David, but uh, President Obama at one point proposed that tax deductions be turned into tax credits with a 28% limit. And while I apologize for not remembering the, the number, there was a fair bit of money involved in doing all that. So I think you're gonna need that. I do think we're gonna have to have higher marginal rates to some extent. Obviously, you don't want to do so to the point where it becomes counterproductive. I think we have got to put our federal support programs, Medicare particularly, but also to some extent Social Security, though the big problem is Medicare, on a sound financial footing, and there are a lot of different ways that you can think about that. Means testing Medicare uh, was proposed by Pre uh, President Obama, and both parties ran away from it. Uh, the CPI adjustments used for Social Security, as we all know, are generally thought to overstate inflation. Uh, President Obama suggested something called change CPI, and I'm told that would have covered about half the problem, the Social Security shortfall. Both parties ran away from it as quickly as they could. We don't have to face these right now, but we're going to have to face them sooner or later. And the longer we wait, the harder it's going to be done, harder it's going to be to do it, and the greater the consequences we will face for not doing it. The ch change CPI was essentially a cut in, C in Social Security that Obama was willing to do with Boehner as part of a deal. Yeah, but he never called it a cut, but that's what no, it was. No, well, and, you know, we, we proposed it too, actually. <laughs> and ARP was kind enough to flood every congressman with, and congresswoman with literature opposing it. You can call it a cut if you want, or you can call it a more realist, a realistic adjustment of Social Security benefits for inflation. I would opt for the second. <laughs> um, so in some of these cases, it famously, FDR understood that, that and, and, and was, was quite far-seeing about this, that one of the ways to build a politically popular program um, is to make it universal. Um, right, to make sure that it applies to everyone. And it seems that some of the things we're saying are, hey, right now the government spends a lot of money, honestly, on people like us, right? We benefit from the welfare state in all kinds of ways. And maybe that doesn't make that much sense when, in the, when all the trends are favorable to people in higher income brackets. But that has this potential downside, right, of, of people say, well, that's just another welfare program, and then they walk away from it. How do you think about that tension? And, and overall, do you think the idea of means testing these programs and essentially reducing benefits or reducing the growth of benefits for higher income people 
in a lot of these programs make sense to pay for some of the wage ideas that you were talking about? Yeah, sure. There's, there's two separate issues implicit in what you've said. So the first is that a lot of rich people benefit from welfare, essentially. I mean, this where we need to take a look for there is tax expenditures. And by tax expenditures, of course, I mean you know, things that you can write off and deductions. So the mortgage interest deduction is every public finance economist's favorite example of a horrible policy, right? It's, it benefits not just homeowners, but people who are highly leveraged in their home buying, right? We spend far more in tax expenditures on the mortgage interest deduction than we do on housing subsidies for people in poverty who can't afford rent. Okay, so that's a clear example where the system is not progressive as it's supposed to be. To your point about universal programs gaining popular support, I think a great example we're seeing now is this idea of universal preschool for everybody. That is not the best way to get a high return on our investment in early childhood. Kids from higher incomes home are already having very enriching early childhood experiences. Many in preschools, many in homes where the parents are reading to them, talking to them, taking them to music lessons. Okay, what I worry about is the fact that by the time the kids get to kindergarten, there are huge gaps in math and reading test scores for kids at the top of the income distribution and the bottom. We need to be putting as much money as we can into providing for high quality daycare and high quality preschool experiences for low income kids. If we take the same amount of money and spread it over everybody, nobody benefits. The, all of the examples we have of successful early childhood interventions are intensive, expensive interventions. We're not going to pay for that for everybody. And if we did, most of it would be inframarginal, and the government would, wouldn't be getting anything for that spending anyway. You know, David, the argument you made is the one that I remember hearing when I was in office as to why we couldn't means test. Maybe it has some validity. Maybe it doesn't. I have no idea. We can't afford it anymore, in my opinion. The, probably the best-known conservative economist in America is somebody I know quite well. And he said to me the other day that if he, with his willingness to compromise, and an equivalent liberal economist with a willingness to compromise would sit down together, they could find solutions that moved us forward effectively on almost all of our problems. When you hear the complexity of these issues, and we've just barely touched the surface of them, it tells you why we need to have a government that's actually engaging in the process of government, takes policy seriously, and is willing, I'm sorry, is willing to work across these huge political and policy divides to find common ground. And absent that, it, with it, I, I believe that we will be the most effective economy in the world, and without it, we will have the problems that we've just discussed. Let's say the markets uh, are roughly right, and that Hillary Clinton is far more likely to become our next president than anyone else. Um, uh, sketch, if you would, let's end on this. Um, and I, I mean Donald Trump as well, but I was on a panel earlier where Mike Murphy was sketching out a scenario in which Trump stays behind in the polls and quits. So whether, and quits the race. <laughs> Donald Trump doesn't like losing. He thinks it'd be better for his brand to blame the Republican Party for not supporting him and quitting um, uh, in September than doing it. Um, Mike Murphy can spin that scenario out better than I can. Um, uh, but let's take a scenario where Hillary Clinton is the president, the Republicans have the House, the Senate's roughly 50-50 either way. Uh, what's your realistic hope for how we make modest progress? And I'm going to ask each of you to answer this as a close. Modest progress on a couple of these issues. What could happen in 2017 that you would consider progress and that doesn't involve, you know, getting crazy rose-colored scenarios going? Let me, let me, may I start? Yes. Yeah, okay. I had the office down from Hillary in the two years that I was in the White House. I, my little thing was in the West Wing and the there, and then she was three floors. I got to know her pretty well. I think she's going to be terrific if she gets elected. I think she is really good at reaching out. She did it in the State Department. She did it in the Senate. So I think she will reach out and she'll be good at it. The question is, you can do all the reaching in the world, and if the other side won't respond, you don't get anywhere. The areas that most people seem to think would have the greatest probability of, excuse me, of attracting a response that enables us to move forward are infrastructure, because it affects every governor, every mayor, every community across the country, and we really have terrible deferred maintenance now. And, and secondly, because of the demographic changes, maybe immigration reform. Having said that, David, I spent a fair bit of time, maybe this is a, you know, a life ill spent, but I spent a fair bit of time with people who love to talk about politics. And the people, I, many of whom you know, and the people I talk to, I'll say that to them, and they'll say, you're right, there's a 5% chance that could happen. 
So I don't know. So that was, that was Bob's optimism. Melissa, what's your... <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I believe... Let me say that. I, or, I, but I, I, in, in defense of myself, I actually believe sooner or later we will get back on track. We've had a resilient uh, political system. We have a dynamic society. Politics changes rapidly in America. The question is how long it will take us. And, of course, it, uh, there are no guarantees. I would start with... Um, you know, expanding support for the most basic needs. The fact that we have 44 million Americans living in poverty, 15 million children hungry. I would make sure we shored up support for the food stamp program. I would dramatically expand support for housing subsidies and residential uh, housing supports. And then I would take a serious look at what we could do with community colleges, not to pay for more middle and high income kids to go to college, but rather to reward community colleges and uh, you know, other four-year colleges that are equipping students with good labor market outcomes. I would spend a lot of money looking at persistence and completion and skill um, development in those institutions. And I would put a lot of money towards um, targeted child care and early childhood programs, nurse family partnership programs, focusing on, the, on lower uh, income families. And to pay for this, I would get back to what Bob talked about, a shift in our federal budget. We spend far more um, on the elderly than we do on children. We need to be means testing a lot of these programs, and we need to be closing a lot of the tax expenditures that favor the wealthy. Thank you both. Thank you. So, So while we, uh, while we get chairs up for the next panel, let me introduce Ida Rademacher, who is in charge of the financial security program at the Institute, and will be the moderator for your next panel. We're going to kick off because we have a running clock as well. David, thank you so much for leading an excellent conversation, uh, helping to put together this deep dive, and for all of the contributions you make to the Ideas Festival every year. It's been fantastic. Um, I'm going to, I don't have to introduce the panel, so I have a minute and I'm going to put a little context on this panel in a couple of ways. First, I'd say that um, when the Ideas Festival started, hi Walter, I'm going to talk about you. When the Ideas Fe Festival started oh, uh, just last Sunday, Walter was the one standing right here. And as he does every year, he really starts this off with a, a big idea. And his big idea this year was realizing that an era of globalization that has really created net growth and prosperity that we have not seen outside of capitalist systems has also left an incredible number of people behind, which is why we're seeing a growth in nationalism today and why we need to rethink uh, a more inclusive form of capitalism as the big idea. So really, that was the, the grounding conversation on the first day of the first session of the Ideas Festival. Christine Lagarde, on the same day, talked about uh, four different macro critical, critical issues at the IMF, three of which have to do with the exact same thing, women's empowerment, inequality, and excess, excessive inequality, and um, uh, also uh, financial inclusion. So uh, on one hand, I want to just start asking the exact same questions you did to our incredible panel. On the other hand, this is the doer panel. Everybody up here, it's an amazing group who uh, has their sleeves rolled up and is really already grappling with solutions that create that new inclusive economy. Uh, I would say that this, I would say one caveat, because this is an amazing group and we have a short amount of time. This is a deep dive, but it's gonna be a little bit more like a shallow wade, only <laughs> kind of in class five rapids, because that's what the issue is and that's what this group is doing things on. So, uh, so bear with us and, and it's going to be more of a conversation and there's lots of deep dive, other opportunities to engage with all the speakers in deeper ways in future conversation. But I wanna leave a little time here as well for all of you to engage in this conversation with our great panel. Uh, so I'm gonna start actually diving in um, with, we'll try to cover three things. I wanna cover with all of you in terms of those strategies uh, some of the things we heard Steve talk about and we heard the or earlier pattern, which is about income and labor markets and what that looks like with um, an inclusive form of capitalism. But I also want to bring in something that we kind of sometimes put as a bullet, but we haven't explored a lot, which is uh, wealth and capital markets 
and the way that that comes into play in an inclusive form of capitalism. And then I really want to spend some time digging into the role of different institutions. We've talked about short-termism, we've talked about corporate, we've talked about government, we've talked about families, we've talked about education. All of these institutions are going to be highly disrupted as we rethink this. So, um, uh, so those are the, the areas we're going to race through, uh, and I'm so excited about this panel, I can't tell you. Uh, Martin, I'm going to start with you. And uh, for those of you who don't know Martin, um, this is, he's going to hate this. I think it's going to be really fun. How many of you know Muhammad Yunus, the name Muhammad Yunus? So for those of you who know Muhammad Yunus, my, my introduction to Martin would say he is uh, America's Southern Baptist banker. Uh, form of a Mr. Yunus in America, and Self-Help Credit Union is really um, a Grameen bank uh, for the kind of issues and financial empowerment uh, processes that we look for in America. So, uh, Martin, I also think that, you know, you've said a couple of things that have been really, I think, telling. You've said that um, you believe we can measure a civilization by how well it creates opportunity for the bottom half, and you've also said that there are two legs to any kind of economic justice. One is wealth, and the other is knowledge. And so most of the conversations we've been having here uh, start with inclusion around income. And I want to ask you why you tend to start with the conversation with wealth. Uh, thanks. So wealth and democracy is not a new topic. If you go back to the great jurist uh, Louis Brandeis, he said, we can have democracy in this country, or we can have great wealth concentrated in the hands of the few, but we can't have both. So the fact that we've had this panel and we haven't really talked about the absolutely obscene disparity in wealth, and that we haven't mentioned the word racial justice or race uh, disparities at all, means that we're really not dealing at the level that I see day to day. So my story is I grew up in an all black neighborhood. I saw my friends killed and destroyed just because of where they were born and the color they were born in the deep south during de desegregation. I started self-help and we started making loans to individual, single parent, African-American mothers. My banker friend said, you can't make these loans, you're gonna lose your shirt. And I looked at them and I said, you know, there's a, a lot of things about banking you know that I don't know, but there are a few things I know that you'll never know. I ate dinner at the table of single African-American mothers my whole childhood growing up. And they would work two or three full-time jobs in order to pay any loan back. I've now made, eight to ten billion dollars of loans to poor people to buy homes, start businesses, do health clinics. <laughs> and I'm going to assert this, and only in Aspen can I sort of get away with this, that poor people are a better credit risk than rich people are any day of the year. <laughs> In my first 11 years, I made $100 million of home loans when we were just a little startup uh, entity to African-American single, single mothers. And over that 11 years, I had zero losses, not one single loss at all. So I feel like I'm angry now that I'm having to prove for the third time in my career that if you get a decent, fair loan to buy and own a home, poor people will do really good with that. They'll be great. And yet the narrative in Disneyland, Washington, D.C. is, well, we've got too much home ownership. Poor people, loans to them is what caused this problem. When 95% of the loans being made by subprime mortgage lenders were made to families that already owned their homes, they weren't new homeowners trying to take advantage of McMansions. And so what I saw, and when we see the discontent that people have, I would say that it's exactly warranted. We have 80% of the American wage workers who earn less in real dollars now than they did 25 years ago. We take 80% of all American households, and do you know what their holdings of wealth are? They own 7% of the financial wealth in the United States, all stocks, bonds, pensions included. The bottom 80%, we're not talking about just the, the bottom 20%, the bottom 80% feel like they can't get ahead. And when you translate this into racial terms, the most compelling, disgusting st statistic about American economy in 1983 for me when we were starting was that black families and Latino families had one-tenth the wealth that white families had. Now here we are 30 years later, the, the median wealth in real dollars for black and Latino families has actually declined over that 30-year period while it's gone up for white families. 
in the last eight years, the scourge of subprime lending and things that aren't even showing on these charts, it's after people have whatever income distribution they have, they were taken advantage of by lenders who targeted families and neighborhoods of color. And in this country, we lost 20% of all black homeowners that existed in 2007 during this period. We've had 8 million foreclosures, but it utterly devastated communities of color. And so, yes, I'm really sort of pissed off about it all. I've I'm been seeing that, doing but I'm this gonna, for a long gonna, time. Gonna, <laughs> and I think it's what, it's what I'm hearing is that um, I'm not hearing any dispute that income prima facie is an incredibly important piece of this and that what families earn, and I want to talk about is it wages, can we grow wages, or do we have to have other strategies to think about floors for income, but that's a necessary but not sufficient yeah, no, no. way to look at the balance sheet of a household and think about when we measure the inclusiveness of economy, we have to measure more than income. Is that, and I think, yeah, is so, that what so you're So income is absolutely okay. critical, and the way I would phrase it is saying income gives a family the choice of how to spend how to make short-term choices. Wealth in a family determines whether you can make long-term choices, whether it's education or starting a business, and you have to have both. And I would tell you that home ownership is still the single stepping stone out of poverty. We did 50,000 loans, and what we found was, and this is the worst period you could have judged in history. From 2005 to 2012, we compared homeowners who got a loan, so when house prices were at a peak, to 2012 when house prices were at a trough, and the families that were able to buy a home had, that started with zero net wealth at the end of that period had $38,000. This is 50,000 families, a very big data set. We did a control group with renters, the exact same profile, and at the end of uh, 2012, that same group, their net wealth from zero had grown to $266. So what I'm telling you is we know the answer, we know how to do it, we need to have the will, and once families have a nest egg that they can believe in, so we can all talk about reform of education, we know that's where the real power is, but if you work with the families I work with, a third of all black men are going to be touched and stigmatized with the criminal justice system. How do you get a job? How do you get credit when you're there? And what most people don't know is that for black females and their children, they have stigmatized, they're stigmatized by eviction from rental housing. So rental housing, you'll see families three or four times during a year be booted out. It only takes 10 days of getting behind. So if you have a family crisis of death, divorce, illness, or job loss, you get thrown out on the curb. What do you tell a child who comes home three or four times to see his mother, which I've seen crying, sitting on the sofa at the curb, and say, well, this system works for you. Just have faith. It's going to work. They end up feeling like, I'm not engaged. I don't have anything. And so owning something, here I am. You know, I'm a lefty. I'm saying owning a piece of property makes all the difference in the world. It lets people have the hope that they actually can engage in education and get ahead. And if you don't do that, you've just got a bunch of theory up here on the top that never even reaches to the 50% of uh, African-American women who get booted out of their house every year. And the one-third of African-American men who are going to be stigmatized for life. You, you've heard this, uh, I've quit. Ferguson, North Carolina, uh, <laughs> Ferguson has 21,000 citizens living in the town of Ferguson. You know how many arrest warrants were issued for nonviolent traffic and parking in 2013? 33,000. More arrest warrants than the entire population of that area. So when, when the police come and say, let me help you, this group of disenfranchised people feel like this is going to stigmatize and penalize me for life. And that's the system we've got that it, in Aspen, we don't necessarily see it. And in policy circles, we just ignore. We're more willing to have a track here talking about sex than we are to talk about racial justice in America. Well. I think, I think there, really, there really has been a great deal of incredible dialogue on, on racial justice with it embedded in this as well. I do think 
that, uh, and I've seen, we've seen stories about this, wealth is a more uncomfortable conversation than sex, for sure, uh, for most people in America, in, in mixed company, right? And by mixed, I mean more income mix, right, than anything else, and even among friends. But I want to create this link, because I, I want to, I, I think that labor, we haven't finished talking about capital markets and wealth, and I want other people to weigh in on that, but they're connected, right, to labor markets and income. And, you know, Andy, I don't know that anybody's done more to think about this in terms of how does uh, the quality of a job and the quality of a bundle of benefits contribute to the kind of opportunities that Martin's talking about. Uh, but, but things have changed, right? And, and the, um, the worker voice has changed and those things. So I'd love to hear for, from your perspective uh, how that uh, labor, the changes in the labor market have contributed to some of the kinds of hard choices and inequalities that, that Martin just talked about. And then, and then, Rana, I'd like you to jump in as well because you've done a lot with your new book on the financialization of some of these issues. Yep. So, so first of all, I always find it funny as a labor leader criticizing other people about thinking only about today or yesterday, since I spent most of my life never thinking about the future. And I think this conversation is a lot about mitigating factors of things that we can do now, all important, you know, minimum wage, housing, and what others. It is somewhat like having a discussion about Uber and wrapping around portable benefits. Enormously important discussion for the next seven years until there's no Uber drivers. And having just come from Silicon Valley, and appreciating what technology is going to do to the labor market, how it's not only going to do what Mark Warner's talked about, but increase the amount of contingent people, but actually eliminate jobs wholesale. And I'll just give one example, and I've just written a book about this, that you know, the largest occupation in 29 states in the United States, United States is truck drivers. There are 3.5 million truck drivers, there's 6.8 million people in it, in financing cars, in auto repair, and in insurance, and all the wraparound motels, giving speeding tickets, whatever you want to do. That's 10 million jobs, largest job in 29 states. There is no one in Silicon Valley who doesn't believe we're going to have driverless trucks in the next 10 years. And so tell me how education, unions, or other things are going to solve that enormous tsunami of a labor market disruption. And so I think all these discussions are enormously important, and a lot of what Marcus, Senator Warner's talked about in terms of building the next safety net, because we are moving from a employer-managed economy to a self-managed economy. We are moving to an economy where no matter how much college education you have, and I teach at Columbia, a third of the MBA graduates in one of the most prestigious universities can't find really jobs. They're now in work centers as entrepreneurs, they call themselves, we used to call it unemployed, you know, <laughs> developing an app or, or something else, because there aren't the kind of jobs now, and we are about to have a storm arrive at our shores, and if we don't begin to discuss it, Brexit and what David Brooks writes about is gonna be a kind future. Um, mm. so, so I'll jump in on the wage share issue. I think that getting the labor share up is a really, really important part of this conversation. If you just look back um, over the post-war period, labor, if you, if you cut up the, the national pie, the corporate share of the pie, the government share of the pie, and the labor share of the pie, the labor share of the pie is at record lows right now. And you know, I'm always struck by a conversation I had once with Howard Schultz, the head of Starbucks, um, who said to me, you know, we're becoming a nation of latte makers and latte buyers. And you have to make sure that there's more latte buyers, because if there aren't, at some point, the math doesn't work on your own business. Um, so, so that's one point. Uh, the reason I got interested in the financialization of the economy is I, I have been covering um, business and economics both here in Europe and the Middle East for 24 years. And I would often see business leaders making these really, really short-term decisions, often around outsourcing um, complex supply chains, paying back investors rather than you know, making kind of long-term risky investments in the new, new thing. And I would think, I know these people are smart. Why are they doing this? And as I began to study um, the rise of the financial sector as a whole and also the way in which the business model of finance had changed, I became convinced that the financial sector was actually no longer being a helpmeet to business as it was supposed to be, but it was becoming a headwind. And there's a lot of research done by uh, important groups like the BIS and the IMF that say that when you get a financial sector that's even half the size of what it is in the US, you start to see slower growth. That plays out for a number of reasons, one of which is that the business model of what banks do has changed. Only about 15% of capital coming out of the American financial institutions today gets invested in businesses. And if you look back, I mean, that's what we were 
we all thought it was supposed to do. Everybody, everybody's savings goes into a bank, the bank lends, new businesses uh, create jobs and growth. So that is broken, but then there's an entirely other part of the capital markets that is basically denigrated, dedicated to the buying, existing, um, uh, buying and selling of existing assets, which basically creates asset bubbles. It's not about what's happening on Main Street. It creates a closed loop, which actually uh, increases that wealth gap um, that we were talking about. And just one really colorful and kind of Kafkaesque example that I focus on in the first chapter of my book is the story of Apple. So Apple is the richest company probably in the history of the world. It's got about $200 billion of cash sitting on the balance sheet right now. Much of it is in overseas tax havens because they don't want to come bring it back and pay the somewhat higher than average uh, US corporate tax rate on it. So the company is borrowing. Now, why is it borrowing money? Because it can do that at very, very low interest rates here in the US. It's not borrowing money to create new factories, pay workers more, do retraining, or you know, invent the new, new thing, per se. It's investing to pay back, uh, to, to, to do share buybacks, and pay back investors, You know, the top 10% of the population, which owns 80% of the asset base. And the company is under tremendous pressure, has been until quite recently from activist investors, like people like Carl Icahn, who used to be called Barbarians at the Gate, now they're activists, interesting rebranding. We can have a whole other panel on that. Um, and I have a whole chapter in my book on that. Uh, but the point is that you have companies, the richest companies in the world, more invested in the capital markets than ever before when they don't need any capital. The capital markets are funneling that to places I would say are not socially productive. And then at the same time, you have small and mid-sized businesses that create 60% of the job growth that can't get what they need um, because of the change in this business model and in part because of flawed regulations uh, and, and a cycle of incentives that is just making everybody do the wrong thing. So I think we have to look at the, an entire ecosystem here. It's not just about too big to fail banks. It's about private equity and shadow banking that's not regulated in the same way as, as uh, other financial institutions. It's about housing policy, tax policy, a flawed retirement system. And we need to think about the ways those work together and create headwinds to growth. So I have to say that I, I branded you guys as a set of doers, and our <laughs> analytical skills are beyond compare up here. But I, I want to get us into the solution piece as well, because I think that um, the next steps of the analysis that we've shown is I think we have enough information. And I think many of you on the panel are saying, we know enough to do something right now. We know enough to act, and here are some ideas we should be working on. So, you know, I'm actually going to focus on the three here in the middle. Uh, Senator Warner, I'd love for you to kind of come into this conversation with, um, with some of the ideas that you have been uh, putting forth and really trying to learn about, because I think you really have been trying to connect the stories that you're hearing from families like the one that Martin works with every day with the kinds of policies that David really talked to and, and um, uh, Bob Rubin really talked to. Uh, so I'd love to hear a little bit about where you're going with that and then, and then bring in you know, Jay and, and Arthur on the same conversation. I see we're at 20 minutes and I'm trying to see how short I can be. As oh, I know you also, can do this. You know, <laughs> you know, I am in Congress. <laughs> and, let me, and let me make a comment, two comments about that since it touched on both of these. Since you know, it, it, I feel like Every panel I've been on, one this morning lunch, there was at least three or four comments saying, if we could only get Congress. You guys, this is your government. You get the Congress you deserve. <laughs> you know, the truth is, I, I was a business guy longer than I've been a politician. I am extraordinarily believe in markets and believe in our system. I believe that it is seriously in trouble at this point. I believe the social contract's in trouble. I believe the very fabric of capitalism, because of some of the comments, and I'll make a couple comments on this, but I think about my friends in business who go to Washington once or twice, and things don't happen like that, and they go home, and then they bitch. The activists on the left and the right are in the fight every day. You know, I, I'm, I'm very lucky, I'm very blessed. I, I, you know, I live the American dream, I've started with nothing, I've failed, I've done well. I get to do this job on terms very few people do. The vast majority of the men and women in Congress actually do want to do the right thing. But we don't give them the wherewithal and the support to actually do it. You know, and, and, and well, there's all kinds of gerrymandering political financing, but you know, more than having an Aspen conversation, you got to be engaged. 
I think there is going to be. I would disagree with the earlier panel. I think the only way, assuming what David mentioned, conventional wisdom, Hillary wins, Senator Jump Ball, you know, Republicans control, control the House, unless we can reframe some of the conversation and, and think about it in a different way, I'm not sure we're going to put points on the board. And if we don't put points on the board between January and Labor Day of next year, watch out. Points on the board let for me, what? Let me, and let me, uh, thank you. Yeah. Let me say, um, Andy is right. You know, 10, 15 years from now, all of those jobs may be gone. I don't think we have 10 or 15 years. You know, Steve is right. 1% is the gig economy, right? It's, it's small. It's growing. What that led me to is the fact that 35% of the workforce is a so-called entrepreneur or an independent contractor or a part-time worker. They're a contingent workforce that has no social insurance, no unemployment, no workman's comp, no disability, no health, no retirement. And when bad things happen, they fall upon a public system that is bankrupt. So unless we rethink a social contract, and I'm not sure, I think Arthur would agree with this. This is not a Democrat or Republican. Unless we think about something that says every dollar you make, some portion of that goes to a portable benefit that's attached to you. And we can argue whether it should be run by government, 21st century union, a private sector entity. And we have some social insurance. And part of that, I would argue, Martin, and I, one of the reasons I, I'm interested in what you're doing about wealth building, it is not only about money, but so many people are income insecure at this point. They fall off that cliff and they get into a debt spiral they'll never get out of. So we need to think about a portable benefit system. We need to think about a capitalism. And Jay, you're going to come to this. In a moment, I would argue something is wrong when iconic companies borrow money to buy back stock. When 30 years ago, 50% of the profits were put back into businesses, and now 95% are in stock buybacks and dividends. That's not the capitalism I grew up with. That scares the hell out of me. So I think there are three levers that we can look at. I think, and you'll hear from Jay in a moment, what can we do, and my faith is in the millennials who I think want to work for and buy from companies that are responsible, and there's a lot of efforts that will be around either name and shame or name and reward, companies that have a value that goes yes to the bottom line, but looks broader. You know, until three months ago, anybody that managed a pension fund couldn't make any investment that looked at anything other than maximization of value to shareholders. Well, arguably, you know, you ought to look at the employees and the community and other things. What, what Jay is doing with the Benefit Corp, and there's a just capital movement, and inclusive capitalism, conscientious capitalism, we need to have metrics that measure responsible corporates. And we ought to argue about what that means. I think there is something wrong with our corporate law structure that does incent short-termism. Steve and I have argued about this back and forth. I think we need to look at a differential capital gains rate for longer term holds. I think we ought to even look at different rules in corporate governance that might allow greater voting power for a little longer hold of a stock value. I think we ought to look at how we can incent money managers to actually have investment returns and payment schedules not based on quarterly returns, but on long term value returns. And frankly, we ought to look for policymakers, and part of this will require tax code changes. Companies that do well ought to get a little extra benefit. And I agree, the tax expenditures you know, uh, is, is way out of whack. And the government's not going to fix it. Of the 34 OECD countries, we are 31st in revenue. State, local, and federal tax together. I know most of us think otherwise, but look at the facts. At some point, facts do matter. <laughs> but when we think about human capital, you know, think about it. We have companies. As companies move forward, and this is globalization technology, and I'm not a Luddite, we're going to move forward with this. But the whole frame is the first thing you should eliminate is human capital because of your very variable cost. You invest in a piece of equipment, that's an asset. You invest in a human being, that's a cost. We're not going to completely change that, but there are policy making that we can do, particularly for low and moderate income people, that says let's go even beyond a dollar in terms of benefit to you as a company if you're going to train them up and maybe put a tail on that benefit so if that person moves to another job, you're not disadvantaged because this moving and flexibility, nobody's going to work for the same company for 40 years. Thanks. But there are things that we can do. And the, the last one I'll make just uh, uh, is that it will not happen unless you go beyond the Aspen conversations and get engaged in the political process, as messy and sausage-making as it is. Because if not, you're going to default to the extremes. 
and the extremes that are being offered right now is not going to be the country that we want our kids and grandkids and a lot of the kids that Martin and all of us care about to have that fair shot that we all had. Thank you. We'll, we'll keep it going. Arthur, I, I, jump in, but I think we also, right, even before we just came up today, you know, your own a sense of uh, how big the labor market actually is, how much productive labor is there and how much excess labor is there and what do we need to do to address those facts as, as part of your analysis coming into uh, a compassionate conservatism uh, in some ways in this conversation about inclusive capital. So I think react to, to, to Senator Warner and, and bring your own kind of contributions into this conversation. Sure, sure. thank you. Um, you know, I realize that I have the burden of <clears throat> representing all conservatives in the world. Yes. Here. Um, no pressure. Uh, so, so, thank you. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll really do my best. And, you know, every time Mark said something like tax cuts, he'd touch me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, which is great because, because he's a great guy and I love it's tax cuts. It's a Pavlodian cuts. response. And, and so, um, you know, I, I, I think that the, a real note of optimism from my perspective is that, we, that the first words out of David's mouth, and it's really, I think, terrific comments to frame this conversation is that one thing that we all accept at this point is that the free enterprise system has created more wealth than any other in the history of humanity. And I want to I want to tie that to something Martin was talking about. Why does it matter? You know, we're talking about conscious capitalism, but we're talking about better capitalism, not less capitalism right. in this conversation. This is a really big deal. You know, we're living in a world that has 80% less starvation level poverty than when I was a child. And the reason for that is because of free trade and globalization and property rights and rule of law and entrepreneurship and all the stuff that made all the people in this room prosper. Now, Melissa made a very important point about that, however. It's not that capitalism has failed Americans, very few of whom relatively are getting meals. This is not, this is not a, a developing nation. But most of whom today feel that the game is rigged, whatever that means. So we have a perception problem about the asymmetry of the benefits of the capitalist system that I think virtually everybody in this room recognizes. It's a really great system that has pulled two billion of our brothers and sisters out of poverty since I was a child. It's a, it's a miracle. It's a humanitarian miracle. The, so, so how do we do that, particularly at the end of a long tail recession? One of the things that we know about financial market crises looking uh, over the past several hundred years, is that they're different than ordinary recessions. Why? Because they have a very long tail. They're, you, they generally take 10 years to clear, whereas an ordinary recession would take more like two years to clear. And, and one of the things that, that my fellow conservatives have said that's quite inaccurate in the political debate is claiming that that if President Obama had simply done his job, everything would have been okay. You know, we could have Milton Friedman in the White House, which would be great, and, and, <laughs> and, and we'd still have 80% of the country with effectively a 0% economic growth rate. Those are the facts. We have a long tail recession with an asymmetric recovery. What is the result of that? The result of that is, is anger. The result of that is feeling that they're left out. Now, your question is, what do we do, those of us who are practitioners, what do we do to vertically integrate all the way down, not to the 20%, and by the way, what are these numbers? When economists like me go on you know, CNBC and we tell lies, like, you know, there's a slow but steady economic growth rate of 2.5%, that's a lie. We have an 80% of the country has a 0% growth rate, effectively, and a 20% population share that has a 5% growth rate. Those are the facts. Now, you can understand how people are dissatisfied with that and how that would inevitably lead to political populism. The problem is, what do we do? And, and the tendency is for all of us who are in the world of policy design. I mean, I'm the president of the American Enterprise Institute. We're a bunch of policy gnomes sitting around all day saying, you know, we could have better life through great policy design, right? N not really and the tendency that we have is to make small sort of marginal changes in the policy environment whereas that's the extrinsic margin of what's actually going to help people in their lives i hate to say it as an economist but it's really a 10 percent economic problem and a 90 a 90 percent sociology problem that we have if you look at public opinion polling about why people are so angry and what they feel they're missing in their lives, and, and this sets out our objective for what we need to be doing in public policy and cultural change, it's not that they feel they're insufficiently helped by the government. They don't feel that way. They feel that they're not necessary. 
And that is a psychological matter. I don't have to go through chapter and verse the, the experimental psychological studies that show that the best way for you to become a miserable person, and if you want more on this, David Brooks and I are doing a panel at, 20, at 515 on, on misery. Um, <laughs> and you, you can look forward to that, by the way. Um, Good conservative response. <laughs> that's right. Um, people will be unhappy if they don't feel needed. Our objective, our sociological, our psychological, our moral, theological, and economic objective should not be to help people more, which we've gotten quite good at, I must say, since the beginning of the war on poverty in the great society. Imperfect, to be sure, but we know how to help people, but we don't know how to need people, do we? I mean, this is an, I think this is an important distinction, and one of the things that we're trying to do at AEI is to gear all of our policies toward making more people necessary. And I want to tell you one quick anecdote before I turn it back over to the moderator on how we learned this as an institution. Now, again, we have 75 PhD scholars at AEI that are working on policy design all day long. We're not very good at learning from the experience of everyday people. But I have dedicated myself for the past eight years as president of this organization to integrate our products all the way down to the to the, the periphery of society, where people need opportunity the most, and talk to high-performing organizations that are getting the job done. And I was working with a group in New York City that some of you may know called the Doe Fund. It's a wonderful group that works with homeless guys who've been incarcerated, are substance abusing, and, and are in the most desperate of straits. These are the people that we tend to say, I give up, right? Now, these guys uh, tend to have very high work uptake rates and very low recidivism. So I'm looking at this program, and I'm talking to the guys going through this program. And this changed how I'm doing my job as president of a think tank when I talked to this guy. This guy had been in prison for 22 years, and he'd gotten out, and he was working for the first time in his life. He was working in a, a minimum wage job, which you know elite, fancy people think of as a dead-end job, because it doesn't pay anything, it's service, it's middle skill or no skill. And, and I said, so how's your life? And he said, I'll show you. And he pulled out his iPhone, which is you know, not the secret of happiness, but pretty cool. <laughs> and, um, and, it, and his name is Rick. It, said, it was from his boss, this manager at this exterminator place. And it said, Rick, emergency bed bug job, East 65th Street. I need you now. And I said, so? He said, read it again. I need you now. This is the first time in my life anybody has said those words to me. That, my friends, is our moral objective. And if we can gear every public policy in education and fiscal policy and in tax and, and everything even up to and including the repatriation of profit such that we can stimulate new advanced and flexible manufacturing in the United States and every technical subject therein. If we can make sure that every single policy has the human face of somebody who is now necessary, we will not be having the same ridiculous populist po uh, set of conversations in 10 years that we're having today. Thank you. I'm going to give 30 seconds. You did I, I know it's right. and, and let me, let me give you one area where I actually think I think there's a, actually Arthur. Are you I, cutting yeah, taxes again by but no, him but no, just or, give you an example. Raising I am I am a small minority of a minority. I'm a pro-trade Democrat. I believe in the, the the notion of value of trade, but I think we got to acknowledge, you know, my story is as governor going to Martinsville, Virginia, when 3,000 textile jobs were t cl shut down overnight, and standing in the rain with all of these folks who'd said all they wanted, 20 years, 30 years, working in the same place was a chance to stay in that community and work some more. Now, we have not, as a pro-trade person, we have not done a very good job of helping those communities that have been hurt by trade. We're going to have an opportunity. You talk about a, a thing that could come up. Okay. TPP is going to come up at some point. Estimates are that that will add over a decade $800 billion to a trillion dollars to the economy. If that is true, and I believe that's true, we ought to be doing more than what We've done so far, which is 4.5 billion, less than half of 1% for those people who are dislocated by trade. There ought to be a way collaboratively with the companies that are winners to incent them to go to the communities that are left behind and frankly do more than $4.5 billion in a program that didn't work in the 90s. Why would it work in the 2010s? 
Trade might be a place where we could give that person who are dislocated by this globalization chance a chance to have that feeling of need again. Here, well, here. Mark, it's great there that you, you bring up trade, and it's also. But I want to make it to Jake. But I'm, I'm going him. We're going to go through the group, but you get the first start on this. But let me, let me throw it to you by connecting the dots here. I mean, I, th I think this idea of being needed and the idea of a moral economy uh, is one that has infused a lot of the conversations here, but nobody's squarely hit. You know, Walter started again at the beginning of the week talking about. Um, the end of an era of globalization, there's a lot of disintermediation. The institutions that worked, that created floors, that created growth, are not the institutions we need going forward for an inclusive economy. So uh, firms will look different. Capital markets need to look different. Labor markets need to look different. The social contract needs to look different. There's a lot of those pieces. And at the end of the day, how we judge it is a moral economy lens which says, do people feel needed? Are they able to contribute to the economy in ways that give them self-satisfaction? And does it actually end up in a growth and in a new era of prosperity that is much more broadly shared? So I'm going to go down the line. We only have a few minutes, and I want to leave time for questions. But I'm going to start with you, Jay, because the first institution I want to rethink is corporate uh, as businesses. And I know you've done a lot to kind of bring that forward. And so I'd love to hear sure. from you. Uh, first, you have a chance to kind of rebut. You've been very quiet for a long time. But in this inclusive economy, what's the role of the employer? What's the role of the, uh, the, the company? Right. So we, we can't have an inclusive economy unless we have inclusive business. And uh, one of the things I agree with with Arthur is that intrinsic motivators are much more powerful than ex extrinsic motivators. And one of the things, uh, before you go on to the, uh, the panel of misery at 515, give you a, a bit of uh, hope as you can maybe carry in and through that panel. Um, Millennials uh, represent 50% of the world's workforce. And uh, they also are about to inherit $30 trillion in the coming decades, which will be the largest wealth transfer in the history of humanity. And one of the things that distinguishes this demographic, which is larger than the boomers, larger than Gen X, et cetera, <clears throat> one of the things that distinguishes this, uh, this population globally is that they no longer want to have the work-life balance that we think about. They want work-life integration. They want to bring their whole selves to work every day. They see business as a tool um, that can be used as a force for good. Good for the workers, good for the communities, uh, good for the environment. And as this sort of tidal wave of energy is coming into the marketplace, uh, business is uh, adopting a place in culture similar to what music was back in the 60s and 70s, which is no longer a bit of entertainment or, in this case, a way to earn a living but it's a source of identity. Uh, what you wear, what you buy, uh, where you invest, where you work uh, is a part of your identity. And so what's happening now is we're at the beginning of an inflection point where we're witnessing one of the biggest uh, global culture shifts and one of the most important trends of our lifetime, which is that group of people that are the people that every CEO is trying to attract and retain, uh, that they're trying to turn those customers into evangelists and, and those, all those wealth managers trying to attract their, their capital and build products for them they're going to have to compete on a, on a, in a new way. And those businesses are going to compete not just to be best in the world, but those businesses are now going to be forced to compete to be best for the world, best for their workers, best for their communities, and best for the environment. And like Senator Warner has said, um, just talking about it isn't going to be enough. Because in an age of social media with digital natives, um, radical transparency, they're going to demand uh, proof. As Cass Sunstein said the other day, uh, what is the evidence for what you claim? And so uh, those companies are going to be adopting uh, impact-oriented governance structures, like the Benefit Corporation. Uh, that's passed in over 32 states with broad bipartisan support. Um, and they're going to need to adopt impact management tools um, to, to measure and manage the impact of their business uh, so that they measure and manage their impact with the same amount of rigor as they do their profits. Um, one, one type of those companies are called B Corporations. Um, and so just like we get the government we deserve, we also get the businesses we deserve. Mm. And so the power, to echo Senator Warner, the power is in the hands of you. Because uh, you are uh, the investors that decide what you want out of your investments, uh, whether you only want to make more money or whether you want to make money and make a difference at the same time. And so the most important thing you can do when you leave here uh, as an investor is to say, what is the measurable positive impact that my investment is having on the world. And the most important question that those millennials can ask when they go into the labor force, when they're interviewing for a job, and they're the ones interviewing the employer, 
what is the measurable impact that your company is having on the world, and how can I contribute to do more of that? That's what the B Corp movement's all about. That's great. I'm still having, um, I'm trying to imagine that, that worker going in for the home health care job, asking their employer that, you know, as the first course of order. So I think there's there, a whole there are a half dozen, set of folks. There are a half dozen cooperatively that. owned, worker owned home health care agencies that are B Corps. So uh, final word, institutions that you think that one word answers, quick answers on in terms of what are some of the institution of the future, what do you think is the most important institution that needs reform for an inclusive capitalism? I'm actually going to flip my answer a little bit and say that I think that technology could actually help us solve some of the labor share issue. We're at a point right now where we have the technologies to make the gig economy into something that it could actually empower workers. You know, you look at disgruntled Uber, Uber drivers who are starting their own platform uh, uh, taxi services. You look at home health care workers in New York that have cooperative services that allow them a greater share of capital. We know from reading our Thomas Piketty that capital returns to capital always are going to outpace returns to labor. I think um, uh, having government offer up things like portable benefits that allow that change to take place um, and having businesses as a whole take more of a stakeholder as opposed to a shareholder value approach is the way forward. Right. Martin? So the final statement is that when you have great wealth in proximity with great poverty, it's the most corrosive force on earth. Most corrosive force on earth. And technology is actually making it worse. It lets the outcomes without friction be accelerated into extreme inequality. The winner takes all. So my challenge will be, we have one of the greatest business sectors in the world in the United States. But it doesn't exist in isolation. And if business leaders don't get involved in schools, I have 28,000 children in North Carolina alone that are homeless every night, expected to come to school and learn the next day. I have, have parents of children who've told me, I pray for my sons every day. And I said, what do you pray? They said, I pray that my sons will live long enough to go to prison. I said, my God, that can't be what you pray for. And they tell me, but time will solve a prison term, but time can't solve a bullet. At the very bottom, we just have an enormous problem that is almost invisible to most of us. Thanks, Martin. I'm going to flip to Andy and come back up, because I think you've had your say. Andy. So I'm going to just flip it a little. I think there's only one policy right now that has the support of Martin Luther King, Milton Friedman, Frederick Hayek, Joe Stiglitz and Charles Murray, which is a universal basic income, and that's going to require a new organization to be created rather than reforming existing ones to fight to make a change that allows us to both end poverty and make a transition to a new economy. Thank you. Um, if I were to pick one policy, it has to be an education system that's adequate to the needs of our country and that serves the civil rights of all of our citizens. We have a, an education system in this country that's both conventional and mediocre, and it has the, also the great benefit of being tremendously expensive, and it's leaving 25% of the country behind, not ready to make a living at any adequate wage at any point in the future. Until we get serious about the civil rights nightmare that is terrible public education in our communities, this is not going to change. I'll get... Where I work and the process I work in is messy, but it's better than the alternative. Don't give up on it. Great. We have time for a couple of questions. According to my clock, we have five minutes. So I see, mm. but we're out. We've got they lie on the time block. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>